And um, do you have a, um, a planet you are most curious about? Well, I'm most, no, not right now. The planets that we're most curious about, in you know, exoplanets, we always live for the future because the best planets are always the ones that are, are coming in the future. I would say that. But another, I just say like, there's so many that are interesting. You know, if you gave me now unlimited amount of telescope time on James Webb Space Telescope, it's going to launch in 2018, I know what I would do with it. And I would choose one planet of each category and just study it in a lot of detail and try to see what, what it's all about. There's another, I can tell you about a few of these planets. Um, one of them is pretty amazing. It's called Kepler 10b. Let's see what it says here, Kepler 10b. And Kepler 10b actually was the first unequivocally rocky planet discovered by astronomers. And this particular planet actually, it's amazing, but look at this. Okay, actually here they really want to show you where the star is. It's, this planet is so close to the star, it's unbelievable. If we can overlay our solar system, um, our solar system actually, that's Mercury's orbit. Look how close this planet is to the star here. It is so close to the star. This planet, Kepler 10b, it's so close to the star, planets that are closer also go around more quickly. Its year is less than an Earth day. And it's so hot, we think that the surface is hot enough to melt rock. So we'd like to study those types of planets in more detail, actually. Look at the atmosphere, see if it has an atmosphere. Um, but is there a planet uh, which has the perfect conditions for life? Okay, right now, the answer is no. We don't know right now. We're at this point in time where we know that planets in the habitable zones are, exist and may even be very common. But all we know about them are their size and mass, or just their size, or just their planet mass. We don't know anything else about them. We know how much radiation, let me say that again. All we know about these planets is their size and sometimes their mass, or their mass. Uh, all we know about the planets is, is very little, really. We know their orbit. We know how far they are from their star. We know how much energy from the star is hitting the planet. We know the mass and or the size of the planet. But what we don't know is anything about the planet atmosphere. We need to know what the greenhouse power is, how massive is the atmosphere, what is in the atmosphere, to know whether the planet is habitable. So in fact, at the moment, we, we don't know. We don't know if it's habitable or not. None of them, actually. We don't have a single one that we could point to and say, there's a habitable planet. Um, but that doesn't stop people, actually, from speculating. How, uh, uh, how much time do you need to point one out? How much time do we need? It's really more about um, telescopes and instrumentation. Because right now, we can have all the time in the world, and until Capacity. we can have better telescopes. Pardon me? Capacity. Capacity, capability, yeah. we'd call it. But there actually is a group of people who do catalog all of the uh, habitable planets so far, actually. Habitable planets catalog. Actually, what I'm trying to do is find you the, it's an artistic representation of the top potentially habitable planets. Oh, here's a bunch of them in their orbits. I mean, there's tons of information about mm -hmm. what people are thinking now and which planets could be habitable. But I'd say our biggest problem at the moment is that the planets we have found today that are in the habitable zone are not the planets we can follow up tomorrow with our new space telescope. So that's a bit of a problem right now. We're able now to get a census, to take data and find planets, but we're not able yet to observe their atmospheres. We'll need a new set of planets that are suitable for atmosphere follow-up to find them. It's nighttime right now. I'm sure we can't see any stars from Tokyo, but let's imagine for a moment we could. We're in Tokyo right now. There's a very special patch of the sky. I want you to see it. Right here. This is where the Kepler Space Telescope stared for four whole years. And look at that. There's just so many stars with planets here, thousands actually, that actually our whole sky should look this way. If we could take a Kepler-like telescope and look at every patch of the sky for four years, we would literally, in this software, on a real map of the, the stars, just we would see it just covered. So this, with stars is, with planets. this is a complete bunch of planets complete bunch of stars with planets because Kepler stared at one tiny patch of the sky for four years yeah. looking for planets. So the, the, 
The part next to it is also filled with planets. The parts uh, next to it are also filled with planets, and here, and here, and here, and everywhere. It's like uh, grains of sand. So many planets there are. Exactly. There's so many planets. This is showing you the Starshade and Telescope launching together. They separate in space and the Starshade petals unfurl from their stowed position. A central truss will expand for the second stage of deployment of the petals. There's the Starshade at tens of meters in diameter and it has to be made so precisely. The petals have to be manufactured to within 100 microns tolerance. And the Starshade has to fly tens of thousands of kilometers from the telescope. All of that aligned just so, so it can block out the starlight precisely enough so we can see planets without the glare of the star. So actually, the star shade is just not an animation. Actually, there's real hardware being built, and there are two issues that we face. We can't build the real star shade on the ground because we can't, we have no place we can put it tens of thousands of kilometers from a telescope unless we go to space. So on the ground, we do two things. We test small star shades to see if we have the math right to validate our, our models. And then we also manufacture the star shade at full scale to show that it can be made and can be deployed to the precision required. So this video, this video shows you one of the deployment tests from August 2013. Here you see the petals stowed and they unfurl. This part is like a real time video. There's a launcher on there that snaps into place. It will snap into place, um, rigidizing the pedal. There you go. In this case, only four are made for cost reasons. Now we're seeing the central truss expand. Don't worry about the people there, because in space, of course, there won't be people. This test is made just to just show that that second stage of deployment, when the truss expands and the pedals snap into place, if that is done over and over again, it's shown to demonstrate that the pedals can deploy to a respective position to each other to within millimeters. It's the position of and shape of the pedals that create the diffraction pattern that we need to see the planets directly. It's so beautiful that it looks like a flower. It does look like a flower. Like, like a, a very natural object. It really does. And actually, I have one of the pedals that was used in that deployment demonstration right over here on my wall. That's that one. It's this one. Mm -hmm. And I asked NASA to please give it to me, or loan it to me. And I do take it around to different places for public outreach when I give a talk somewhere. We'll ship it around the star shade. The pedal actually gets shipped in advance. This is showing you some of the known planetary systems and their relative orbits. The planet size corresponds to the planet mass. I'm sorry, the planet size just illustrates the different relative sizes. But look how look at them. All these planetary systems are out there. Planets are just orbiting around and around and around. So there must be life somewhere on one of those planets. Maybe not on one of these in particular, but somewhere in our galaxy. There's got to be a planet with life somewhere. <laughs>